A bipartisan group in the House and Senate has introduced a war powers resolution to end the war in Yemen and U.S. involvement in the war in Yemen. Legislative Director of Middle East Policy at the Friends Committee on National Legislation, Hassan El Tayeb, is with us to discuss this new war powers resolution. Hassan, welcome to the show. Thanks for having me, Ryan. And so this this was a an effort that began or, or that was tried during the Trump administration. The Trump administration vetoed it. Um, I think you and others were pushing for progressives and, and this coalition of, of anti-war conservatives to push again on a war powers resolution effort in the beginning of the Biden administration. Instead, the movement uh, decided to push instead for uh, legislation in what, the NDAA, the, the, the military authorization bill, and, and, and other efforts to kind of curtail U.S. involvement in the war. Those, have, I guess, haven't worked because here we are back with a, a war powers resolution. What did it take to get this entire coalition back on board uh, with pushing a war powers resolution through Congress? And, and who do you have? Because it's an interesting mix of Republicans and Democrats and independents on this, on this effort. Yeah, thank you so much, Ryan. We've been pushing the entire time, uh, you know, early on in the Biden administration. We, you know, we appreciated that, you know, there was an, an announcement to end, you know, offensive operations, but then we tried to clarify what that actually meant. And then we learned that critical components of U.S. support were ongoing, including maintenance, spare parts, logistics for Saudi warplanes. And I'll just add that Saudi Arabia was on a bombing spree last year. They bombed as much as they did under Trump and uh, also tightened their blockade and really made the humanitarian crisis even worse. So we kept pushing. We were trying on a whole bunch of different vehicles. We got over 100 members of Congress to sign letters about the blockade. Um, but then we passed a, a resolution. The House adopted this uh, Kana, uh, you know, Chairman Smith amendment to curtail this ongoing U.S. involvement. We got a simple majority, uh, 208 Democrats, 11 Republicans, 219 total. Uh, but that didn't end uh, U.S. participation. It got stripped out in the NDAA. So we just kept pushing. We built a coalition over, of over 100 national organizations uh, across the political spectrum. And we're able to uh, assemble, I think, a really nice coalition on the Hill uh, with reps uh, Jayapal, DeFazio, Mace, Chairman Schiff leading uh, but we've got a whole bunch of other folks. We've got frontline Dems like Susan Wilde and Katie Porter on. Uh, we've got uh, folks like Garamendi on the House Armed Services Committee. We've got senior Democrats on uh, House Foreign Affairs, including Reps Connolly, Ted Lieu. Uh, and Bernie Sanders also on the press release announced that he's also preparing to introduce a companion uh, war powers resolution in the Senate. So lots of exciting stuff this week. Yeah, and Ryan mentioned something interesting, which was that in the Trump administration, this didn't go anywhere. But one of the most interesting divides between Donald Trump and the kind of MAGA people um, who have come into Congress and into the Republican Party in the Trump years is that a lot of them are willing to join coalitions like these. They're extremely uncomfortable um, with the, the situation in regards to war powers and how they're used in conflicts exactly like this one. Can you speak to um, how it what it's been like to get uh, the, the sort of Republican side on board um, in the over the course of the Biden administration in particular? Well, there's a nice sliver of uh, libertarian Freedom Caucus Republicans that really care about Article One, Section Eight, constitutional war authority, and rightfully so. They think that uh, you know, Congress, not the executive branch, should be d able to decide when and where we go to war. And I think that's great. So we've really tried to bring this group together and we might not agree on everything. Granted, I'm, I'm not, you know, talking to them about all of the issues I care about, but on the ones we do, we're trying to find common ground. I think that's what, you know, that's what it's all about. Uh, we've got groups like Concerned Vets for America, Freedom Works, Defense Priorities. Uh, these, uh, you know, conservative-leaning groups have been absolutely critical in helping us bridge this divide. Uh, so, you know, really thrilled with this, you know, diverse and bipartisan effort. That's a really big deal. I mean, getting those those groups on board is huge. Yeah. 
Well, thank you. Uh, you know, it's it's been a lot of work. I you know I, I got to say we've got a you know wonderful coalition of of people, including Demand Progress, Just Foreign Policy, uh, Yemen Relief and Reconstruction Foundation. So it's been a real team effort. Folks at the CPC, uh, the staffers have been great. So we're we're trying to keep the momentum going. And you know, I'd be remiss if I didn't say that. Uh, on the you know the day that they introduced this Yemen war powers resolution, the warring parties in Yemen agreed to uh, extend the truce and, and continue you know the cessation of of hostilities uh, for another two months. So I think it's just clear. Whenever we see Congress sort of speaking out, reasserting itself, we tend to see historically, not just in this case, but several others I could point to if we had more time, maybe, uh, you know, when Congress reasserts itself, we do see the warring parties tend to you know, move closer to peace. So we got to keep that going. Right. And for people who haven't been following along, about two months ago, there was this announcement of a two month ceasefire that's now being extended. I, and I, my understanding is that Biden's trip to Riyadh and his meeting with Mohammed bin Salman is going to rope in the Yemen war. Do, what, what's your sense of how there's go, the relationship between kind of OPEC production, gas prices, Biden agreeing to meet with MBS and a potential uh, settlement to this war uh, coincide? Yeah, obviously, this is a critical moment in the U.S.-Saudi relationship. You know, for the sake of oil price concerns, President Biden, Biden is breaking his rule of not dealing directly uh, with Crown Prince Mohammed bin Salman and plans to travel to the region, uh, not only to meet directly with MBS, but also to formalize a U.S. security commitment to Saudi Arabia, as well as other Arab partners in the region. And, you know, it's important to remember Biden said, you know, Saudi was a pariah. He wasn't going to deal with Mohammed bin Salman uh, because of not just the war in Yemen, but also the gruesome murder of uh, Jamal Khashoggi. And, you know, obviously we're trying to make clear that, uh, you know, Congress, any deal, any security cooperation, you know, pact that happens needs to include ending the Yemen war. So this is such a welcome war powers resolution, uh, you know, at this perfect moment, because, you know, we have to end the war, but we also have to make sure Yemen doesn't get thrown under the bus here, uh, you, you know, as, you know, we're trying to, you know, lower oil prices. Obviously, you know, there's a lot of concerns here, but Yemen has been dealing with a, a massive humanitarian crisis for over eight years at this point. We've got 16 million people on the edge of famine. We've got 400,000 people or so that have already died in the past eight years. And 60% of those, I'll just add, were killed because of you know indirect causes like the Saudi blockade, blocking the ports of entry, uh, you know, blocking uh, fuel through Hodeida and medicine. I'll say that the truce, uh, you know, it's been uh, pretty successful so far in a couple of respects. I just wanted to lay out, you know, sort of what has happened. We've seen 12 fuel ships finally get in through Hodeida port. They've released over 300,000 metric tons of fossil fuels. And that's really helping power hospitals deliver food in the area. We've also seen flights, uh, really critical flights from Sana Airport to uh, Amman, Jordan. We've seen about three or four so far. They just announced an opening to Cairo. Uh, so progress there. And we've seen no uh, cross-border attacks, no Saudi airstrikes, and no Houthi drone attacks. So all really good, good signs. Uh, you know, the thing that gives me worry and, and keeps me up at night is that there are a lot of other issues that remain. Uh, there's, you know, closures in Taz. They want to open up uh, roads in, in parts of Yemen. Uh, we've, you know, there's a, there's been a distance there. So we need to keep the pressure on. And again, really grateful to uh, Jayapal, Reps Jayapal uh, Schiff, uh, you know, DeFazio and Mace for leading this effort at this critical moment. Okay, well, Hassan, thanks so much for joining us and thanks for the update. Hey, thank you both so much. Really appreciate it. And we will have more Rising right after this. Stick around.